In order to keep bringing you guys tons of free content, we work with brand partners who you'll hear from in this episode, including an advertisement from Zopa Bank. You might have seen our guest this week ruffling a few feathers on Celebs Go Dating, The Apprentice or Good Morning Britain. It's the wonderfully funny and charismatic Ryan Mark Parsons. Here at Talk 20s, we're all about figuring your shit out and we love sitting down with famous faces from all walks of life, finding out what makes them who they are, how they are navigating the roller coaster decade that is our 20s. You're truly in for a treat with this episode, but before we dive in, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button so you never miss an episode of Us in the Studio. Ryan Mark, so a little bit of something different today because this morning you were on Good Morning Britain, today mm. in the Talk 20 studio. I know, I've been hopping from studio to studio. Yeah, we and love that's it. That's why I'm so smart. Yeah. I'm <laughs> ordinarily a bit more relaxed from podcasts, but. Dress yeah. for TV. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's always good to make an effort. So Always good. I actually usually wear trainers on, on the podcast. And because I knew you were coming, I was like, I'm going to have to wear some heel boots. I know, or something. I've so, these amazing. Yeah, every, red it, shoes. Adam, we got a comment when I came into the studio today. I love your boots. <laughs> so, so everyone knows that it's not normal I wear the boots, but I did put the boots on for you. Well, thanks for um, making an effort. For we me. always. We always kick start the podcast by asking our guests to look back at a year ago because mm. there's a conversation. People always say the person you are at 30 is completely different to the person you are at 20, but we always have to go through all of those years, right? How often do we ever look back and reflect on what we were doing a year ago, at what yeah. what we were feeling, thinking, doing? So could you get your phone out for us? Okay. Have a little scroll on your camera roll and bring up a picture or something that springs to mind from last year. And tell us a little bit more about that photo. Explain that photo to us. Okay, so a year ago. Yeah. Okay, let's Around about, we're well, filming in November, so November last last year. Give us a bit of an insight into your life. A little behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. okay, Something let's... maybe you haven't shared on social media? Gosh, already? I think I share everything on yeah. social media. I think <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I haven't shared on social media. Let's see. There was... Let's see. This is kind of like behind the scenes on a, a show that I was filming... In Wales. Okay. Let me. What uh, was the show? Let me bring it up. It's a documentary for S4C and okay. BBC iPlayer. And I was in Wales with Gemma Collins and Luca Bish from Love Island. Okay. And they kind of put me on a farm. Here's a video. That is it. Okay. I don't know if you can, is it playing? You're dancing about? I'm dancing about with the Welsh, with the Welsh flag. flag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really okay. patriotic. In a random car park in the middle of with loads of trees. That's what I can see. We'll put it on the screen. Some some car park in the yeah. middle of nowhere. And I think it was the last day of filming. And okay. I was just so relieved to be off that farm. Yeah. Because it was it was pretty traumatizing. Why was it traumatizing? Well, not Gemma Collins, but the farm. <laughs> I mean, the farm. <laughs> well, maybe. But the farm was just... <laughs> It was just so extreme and so different to what I'm used to. Yeah. I've always lived in London, born and bred. Mm -hmm. And then they drove me to North Wales. I was filming something else for Channel 4 and I was going all over the UK. And then at the end of that, I was sent off to Wales and I was in the middle of nowhere. And the concept of the show was what? For you to experience farm life? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Essentially, yeah. Taking a few reality stars people that have done reality shows in England to Wales mm -hmm. with a connection to Wales. And my friend, uh, Jamie, he's from Wales. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I did the Duke of Edinburgh's Awards mm -hmm. and the Brecon Beacon. So I had a little connection to Wales. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it was about immersing us in Welsh culture. And it was it was pretty shocking. Yeah. In a good way, though. In, in, in a, a good, good way. It doesn't sound like a good way, though, because you're kind of saying I really wanted to be off that show. I, I wanted to be off the farm. But it's actually pretty sad. Like when I got back to London, I was kind of yearning for that countryside, fresh air and sheep and... Yeah. Cow poo. Uh, <laughs> I was inseminating a cow, actually. Really? Yeah. So, you know, those long gloves you might have seen a farmer yes. wear. Yes. Yeah. I had to then stick my... No. Yeah. I don't want to be too graphic. I don't <laughs> no. know if this is after the watershed or not. <laughs> but, so yeah. you stuck your hand up a cow's like, butt? Yeah. 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 All for, all for Did TV. they get pregnant? Did it work? I think so. I hope so. I hope so. So there's it a little... Them... There's a little cow running around in a field right now. It was birthed by you, technically, or impregnated by you. It was impregnated by me. Yeah, I think I. I, <laughs> I don't I'm know, the maybe reason. We make <laughs> well, into a maybe clip. rephrase that. <laughs> yeah, I no, don't endorse any of that behaviour. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's rewind on that. But yeah, okay. So that's like, so so that kind of gives us an insight into your life. Like, because it's been pretty crazy. Like not many people get invited to go to farms and film crazy TV shows and do all of these kind of things. You've had quite the experience for <laughs> a 20... <laughs> 
Sorry. You're still laughing at you yeah, impregnating just, a cow. The, yeah, the, yeah. Too funny. But you've had quite the experience of, you know, so many different things that you've done and stuff like that yeah. on on TV. Like, what is that an insight into your life? I guess so. It's a very extreme version of my life. I mean, it's not like like that every day. Yeah. I wish it would be like that every day because it is so fun. And I'm really grateful to get these opportunities and really off the back of The Apprentice that I did mm -hmm. a few years ago when I was 18, 19. So I love what I do now. It's definitely a passion that I discovered kind of organically after doing The Apprentice. Yeah. And I realized this is what I should be doing. And speaking to friends, similar age, I'm 23 now. Mm -hmm. They've just left university. They might've done a master's or whatever. A lot of them are still discovering what they want to do, which I think is absolutely fine. But I feel kind of blessed that through these experiences that have just appeared mm -hmm. and have happened in my life that I've been able to work out what I actually enjoy. And the bonus is well, I get paid for it. So yeah. it's just kind of a win-win. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. Not many people go into kind of the world of media and TV. Like what, what excited you about that? Did you, did, did you feel growing up that that was something that you were going to end up in doing like for a job? I know you said it came about quite organically, but yeah. When I was younger, I always used to act. So okay. I loved performing to an audience. And I guess what I do now is a part of that. Instead of seeing the audience, I perform to an audience at home and mm. I get all of the feedback on Twitter yeah. and then my Instagram <laughs> requests and all of the lovely messages I receive from the trolls all over the UK. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I guess it's it's something that I always thought I, I could not see myself doing and have ended up doing. And did I forecast exactly what I'm doing now? Not necessarily, but I think it makes sense. Yeah. When I think back to what I was doing when I was younger, definitely I can see why mm -hmm. I do this stuff now. And the right mark that we see on TV, is that the person that is the day-to-day? -day? Like, is that like really you? Because I think that's what we find often when we scratch beneath the surface of reality TV stars or TV personalities that their lives, they, they put on a bit of a show or like, what is the reality for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, I haven't really said this before. So the name Ryan dash Mark, and that's something that became a bit of a thing <laughs> yeah. when I did Celebs Go Dating last year. Rob Beckett. Yeah. Like he yeah. completely, yeah. Rob Beckett rinsed me for that. Uh, became <laughs> Dash Tron, Slap yeah. Dash, all kinds of Dash, whatever. Yeah. That came about because of The Apprentice and there was someone else with a similar sounding name mm -hmm. and they had to distinguish me. So they called me Ryan Dash Mark. It's actually my name, yeah. but they can join the name. And I kind of adopted it after The Apprentice. Yeah. And then it kind of became a bit of a persona. Mm -hmm. So when I do TV shows, I kind of fool, I kind of use this as a glaze yeah. to kind of be really audacious and to say people from Brighton stink and, and yeah. all kinds of like really controversial things because... I do it with always with an essence of comedy. Mm -hmm. I never really want to upset anyone. Mm. I like stirring the pod and yeah. I like being naughty and the pantomime villain, but I feel like I can do that more easily with this Ryan Dash Mark yeah. character. But Ryan, day to day, what all of my friends call me, is just someone that likes to go to Soho House and have a few picantes. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's it. You know, I just like to chill out. I don't want the drama. Yeah. I save that for the cameras. Yeah. I love it. It's like a bit of a personality, a bit of persona. And like, mm. why have you not like shared that before? Do you think? Like, why is that not something you've spoken about before? I think people that know me well can definitely tell the difference. Like mm -hmm. everyone I meet in real life, when they've seen me on shows, be it The Apprentice or Celebs Dating or the things in between, they kind of say, oh, you're so different. Mm. Um, wow, you're like more relaxed and, <laughs> you know, you're not trying to offend someone. And I just think it's easier. It's less stress. Yeah. It's less headache. It's exhausting, I think, sometimes playing mm -hmm. a character on TV. But then I know why shows get me on because they, the public mm -hmm. like that person that I play mm -hmm. and I think I can do it well. Mm -hmm. No, you so. do do it well. So we've seen some funny things that you've chatted about, like eating alone in a restaurant and then didn't they bring up a picture of you <laughs> sat in McDonald's eating by yourself? Yes, like, they did. Your view yeah. was that, oh God, you can't <laughs> eat in a restaurant alone. I love the debates that you get 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 into and I think it's it, it's it's it makes for great television. You're a great entertainer. Like you. you're brilliant at what you do. 
quick ad break from Zopa Bank. See if you could cut your monthly cost by connecting your accounts using the Zopa Bank app. Simply head to the For You page in the app, link your accounts and get personalized insights and tips to see if you could save on your bills or subscriptions. Just search Zopa, that's Z-O-P-A, in your chosen app store and start saving money now. Um, but we want to scratch, this is a Talk 20s podcast. We want to scratch beneath the surface and understand a little bit more about you and your 20s and kind of a little bit more about how you got to the position where you are right now. And yeah. I know one of the things that you really want to talk about on the podcast is, is coming out and mm-hmm. your whole experience and how that process was for you. So tell us a little bit more about that. What age were you? How did it come about? And what, were the, what was your situation? So it was pretty much, I think, trying to remember what age I was. It kind of happened because of TV. And I guess this is why TV is so significant to me Mm. because it was a tool for me to come out in a very public way. I did a show on BBC Three. It was Celebrity Eating With My Ex. Mm -hmm. And the format in a nutshell is that they bring an ex to... They got my ex back and we went to a hotel in London and we kind of sit down and talk about what happened Mm -hmm. in the relationship. But prior to that, I hadn't really had any kind of discussion with my family about my sexuality. So that was the first time it was broadcast and it was done in a very public way. It was televised and I think they watched it on BBC iPlayer and they were able to to see for the first time. So yeah, that's why I, I guess TV's always had a very special place in my heart because I used it really to become more of myself and mm. to express myself in a really authentic way. Uh, but yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I must have and been 20 or something. Wow. And so your parents, what were their reactions? Like, like obviously you said, I'm doing this show and did you give them much context or did you just get them to kind of tune in? Yeah. I mean, I didn't tell them about it. It was okay. my manager that sorted it out and I, found out about the show and I agreed to it. I thought it was a bit of a weird concept, but I thought, yeah, why not? And yeah, they kind of just watched it for the first time. I didn't brief them on it. I didn't really, I didn't really speak to them about it after. Okay. There was no kind of discussion about it. I think it's because my family are very traditional, very religious Roman Catholic background. Mm -hmm. Half of my family from Ireland as well. Okay. And heavily religious. So I just feel like it was such a taboo thing to discuss. I didn't actually feel comfortable I didn't know talking about it really. I just wanted to be as bold as possible and to go on the show and to just be myself in in every way imaginable, uh, which I was, and for them to see it when they wanted to see it and Mm -hmm. for me not to talk about it. Okay. And have you spoken about it since? No, no. I mean, there have been, when I did Celebs Go Dating last year, the premise of that show, going on dates. uh, Again, that was very conspicuous, the press were reporting on different things. Mm -hmm. And I think family from Ireland were then speaking to the press. So I was then seeing all of these stories come out in the tabloids, the online tabloids about what they're thinking, but we never ever had direct communication. So all of the thoughts and discussions and feelings that everyone's, that everyone has in the family, Mm -hmm. I've seen through the press and I haven't actually had any direct dialogue with with anyone, Mm -hmm. to be honest. That must be hard for you. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it is. I don't know. I kind of like it and I kind of don't. It would be ideal, obviously, to have an open chat and conversation about these things without the judgment, but I kind of, it saves me from being in a situation where I feel judged or I'm being made to feel a certain way because I can understand how they feel without having to speak to them. So I kind of see it as a blessing in disguise Mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, ideally it would be nice to have direct communication, but it's not, it's not that way. I'm sure for many people that, you know, not every family is going to understand, you know, their own situations and coming out and things like that. And so I think for many people, a lot Mm. of, a lot of listeners might be thinking, you know, it's something that I want to be able to speak to my family about, but I just don't know how it will be received or what they will think. Like, so I think hearing your story will be quite a, you know, an interesting angle because it's such a unique way of kind of showcasing who you are as well. It's very, it's a very public way. Yeah. Do you think you ever will chat to your family about it or? I don't know. I mean, even in my future, I Mm. I, I, I foresee a wedding 
somewhere in the middle of nowhere, like a right. little a little beach in the Seychelles, and just <laughs> just invite the Sounds minimum. Sounds gorgeous. Yeah, can I inv- come? <laughs> yeah, you can come. Yeah, we'll see how this podcast goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, just like completely away from civilization, maybe yeah. like the minimum amount of people required to be at a wedding. I just thought that is my. I'm, I'm, I'm quite private actually. Yeah. Like all of this stuff, I don't really talk about that that much. You see a different side to me on TV and that's me playing up to that character, but that allows mm-hmm. me to be private because I'm not really being myself in every single way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I like to be shielded and I, I don't like all of this being out there, mm-hmm. but sometimes it just happens and people talk to the press. Can't mm-hmm. do anything about that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So how are your family about everything else that you do online? Like, did they kind of expect that for you as well? Like, you know, there's so many shows that you've done. Like, what did they think when you weren't on The Apprentice? Like... I think they're embarrassed by all of it, really. Really? Yeah, especially the debates. So I do a lot of debates on Good Morning Britain and they tend to be really controversial. Mm-hmm. I think the last debate that really went viral, got millions of views, was when I said that people that eat alone are losers. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think when they see... <laughs> Um, I think when they see stuff like that, yeah. they're like, oh my gosh. Because they they come from like very traditional backgrounds, uh, very traditional jobs in finance. And everything I do is just so alien and yeah. peculiar to them. And there's like no rationalizing what I get up to. And I did a dating show on BBC Three with Young Philly. And I was going around people's houses and judging their houses and whether I wanted to go on a date with them. Like, there's no explaining that kind of thing. They didn't yeah. even know who Young Philly is. So it's like, yeah, what what do I say? Mm-hmm. I don't know what to say. I just kind of do it. And like, is like Christmas Day or awkward or like when you go and see your family awkward? Like, what do you chat about if they, if they like, because I think a lot of people, I think you're the extreme, but like a lot of people will think that their parents or their family and that don't understand them. Yeah. And I think this is like that to the extreme, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I'm like a very bizarre case. I think when it comes to family gatherings, birthdays, Christmas, whatever brings the families together, I try to avoid. Okay. I mean, some things are unavoidable, like Christmas. I try to be there. I mean, yeah. although this year I want to go to Greece. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll be maybe I'll be in London. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, when it, if I if I have to be with the family, I kind of just talk about anything else. Mm-hmm. Maybe the Queen's speech when she was alive, or you know, next would be the King's speech, <laughs> or uh, whatever's on BBC One, whatever's on ITV. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk about anything else, but the stuff that I get up to, mm-hmm. and I think it's boring just talking about this mm-hmm. stuff as well. I, I feel like I talk about it all the time. I do podcasts and all kinds of things. Yeah. I feel like I want to change the subject sometimes. Yeah. You just want to spend time with your family. Yeah, yeah. And hear what they get up to. Yeah. One of the other things we wanted to chat about on the podcast is the whole idea of like, you're an extremely ambitious young person. Like you've got so many big goals for like what you want to do. And, you know, starting off going off on The Apprentice, like you must have started out with huge, huge goals. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you feel like you've achieved the goals that you wanted to achieve in life? Or where do you see yourself heading? I definitely haven't achieved anything in okay. terms of what I want to achieve. I feel like I feel like with some people, it's a blessing and a curse where you can do so much, but you're never happy. Mm-hmm. And that's great for me because I'm never complacent. Like everything I've done is never enough. Like some people look at me, I talk to some of my friends and they're like, oh my gosh, you've done this, this, this. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I just like, well, actually... Millie Bobby Brown is so much younger than me and Mm -hmm. she's making a lot more money than me and Mm -hmm. she's more famous. So I'm always kind of like, yeah, well, it can be so much better. It can be so much bigger. And therefore I'm never, ever, ever happy. Mm. And I think that's, that's the sad thing because you don't get to enjoy the things you do because you're constantly comparing. There's this perpetual race to be the best. And it's great because then you're striving for success constantly and that leads to great things like more money and more recognition and doing amazing things all of all of the wonderful things that coming that come with success but also do you, I guess it's a philosophical question as well because do you ever get to reap the rewards of the success that you build because you never really enjoy it because there's always something that you're striving to achieve so it's kind of bit it's a bit paradoxical Mm-hmm. And it's sad because I don't think that will change. And I kind of don't want it to change because I never want to be complacent. It's part of who you are, right? Yeah, it's yeah. part of who you are, but it is frustrating. And I think a lot of people, especially people who listen to this podcast, will understand exactly what you're talking about. It doesn't matter what your goal is. It doesn't matter whether that's, you know, TV, business, career, finance goals. 
it, a lot of us will achieve what we set out was our initial goal and get there and be like, okay, well, I thought it was going to be fireworks. Yeah. I thought there was going to be this great big celebration. I thought I'd feel a certain way. If I do this, then I'll be happy. When I do this, then I'll be happy. A lot of us say that to ourselves all uh -huh. the time. Uh -huh. But often we get there. We maybe haven't even realized that we got there because we've already put 20 other goals in our, in our diaries or plans or whatever we want to do. And we get there and it's like, you know, what's the next thing? And it's never been satisfied with where you're at. It's tricky. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. I think you really hit the nail on the head in terms of how I feel. Mm. You probably encapsulate the feeling of so many other people as well that are listening or watching this. And I, I, I guess the best analogy for me is that I bought a watch last year and I was really looking forward to buying it. I went to Harrods, I picked it up and then it was like, right, well, that, you know, the, yeah. the feelings kind of dissipated and it was the, the instant gratification. It doesn't have to be what should be anything mm -hmm. that you want. You have this amazing feeling when you buy it and then mm -hmm. it kind of starts to fade and you're like, okay, well, what's the next thing that I can buy to just give you that momentary happiness? And I feel like that is very similar to my work in terms of I get a new show, mm -hmm. right? That's great. Enjoyed it. Get, get paid for it. But then what's the next show? Mm -hmm. So then do you really enjoy anything? Our generation don't watch the news, we don't read newspapers, and we don't listen to the radio. We consume things differently. We get fed information all the time, but only in bits and pieces, never the full story. And who knows what's accurate, but there's so many important matters going on in the world that we never want to be uninformed or ignorant. I recently subscribed to The Knowledge, a free daily newsletter that takes just five minutes to read and helps me make sense of the news. Their team of editors read hundreds of trusted media sources from around the world, so I don't have to question the accuracy of where I get my news. The team and I love it and we wanted to share that with you guys in case you were feeling the same way as us. It's completely free and you can sign up at www.thenowledge.com forward slash talk 20s. It's such a deep philosophical question. It is a very question. deep Look question. Look at us getting like... very deep but I, I think it needs to be talked about because so often in life like you know and all the way when we go through school and stuff, we're told like, if you get this career, then you'll be happy. If you do this, then you'll be happy. Mm. If you do this and that. And I think it's really hard because happiness doesn't really just come out of achieving goals. And I think a lot of us attribute us to buying a watch or achieving this in our career and thinking like, that means that I'll be happy. But like, yeah. actually, I don't think it's that at all. Like, is there, is there moments in your life where you feel make you happier than others, like apart from purchasing a watch? When I'm truly happy, I would say it's when I'm traveling. Okay. When I'm on a holiday and I'm actually away from London, as much as I love London, mm -hmm. I was born there. I've always lived there. It's, it has a place in my heart. Uh, I, I like being away from London. Mm -hmm. So I guess I like being away from the FOMO. That's yeah. a big thing I battle with. I can't ever sit at home knowing that someone's at the club. Yeah. It's a Saturday. I know there's work to be done or whatever, but I have to be, I, I have to be there. I have to see it. I want to kind of, even if I'm there for five minutes, I just, I just want to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think there's that constant urge to like satiate my curiosity. Mm -hmm. So when I'm traveling, I love Greece. Greece, I go every year mm -hmm. to, and I feel so zen. I feel so at peace. I'm just by the beach or I'm on a boat and I'm just like completely away and divorced from reality, mm -hmm. even for like two weeks or a month. And I would say that's when I'm really happy. And also when I walk, mm. when I go hiking and I'm in like the Lake District or the Cotswolds, wherever it is, as long as there's no people around me, I feel, I feel so, I, I feel so Isn't that crazy nice. that your biggest happiness is like, being away from all the things that you are probably striving so hard to get actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel the same. Like when I, I think a lot of people, when you take a, a step back and you look back at what you've got, it makes me feel happy for where I'm at my, my home life or whatever that is. But then it also kind of gives me some understanding of like, Oh, I wish life could be like this all the time. I guess we all wish we could be on holiday. You know, that would yeah. be really good. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, like I can, I can understand, like, I think we're all also, on this conveyor belt and it's like a machine that just keeps going round and round and round and round and round and it never stops. Like this mm. treadmill just goes round and round and that's life, isn't it? Mm. Like we have to get on the treadmill, we have to earn our money, we have to pay our bills and it just keeps going. So I guess when we step off it, those are our moments that we can go, oh, like life's good or yeah. Yeah, I think that's when I can appreciate things more. Yeah. It's difficult when you're in London because you're always 
I, I think it's a comparison culture. Yeah. That's what I want to call it because you go on Instagram, I follow, a lot of my friends tend to be very ambitious as well. Yeah. And I think it's important that you surround yourself with ambitious people, people with aspirations. And that just tends to be the case with the people that I follow on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then you see what they're getting up to. And then you're like, oh gosh, that looks incredible. I should be at this event or that looks amazing. I should be working with this brand mm -hmm. or I should be on this TV show or I should be doing this X, Y, Z. So you're just constantly comparing. And I'm sure people can relate that are, that are seeing this or listening to this where you follow certain people and you just kind of want to do what they're doing and then you think about your life and how it compares to theirs. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of have to realise that you're so, you're in your own lane. Mm -hmm. And that's what I keep, I need to keep reminding myself that I'm doing my own thing. They're doing their own thing. People do this at 24, 23 or 26 or 30 or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I, You know what I think about Kris Jenner? She became very successful, I think maybe in her 50s. Yeah. I think that was the peak of her career when she was making most of her money. Yeah. When the family were doing really well. And it took her that long. Mm -hmm. And she started off as an air stewardess. I mean, she is my inspiration. <laughs> Chris Jenner, I mean, it I, sounds a bit yeah. cliche. Reality no, star, no. Blah, 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 but I, I, I love her. Yeah. What would you do if you met Chris Jenner? What would I do? I'd ask for advice. I wouldn't ask for a picture. Really? If I had what, if I could only do, ask for one thing, I'd ask for advice because I feel like she is such a media expert, PR yeah. expert. She's like the go-to, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, look what she's done with her children. It's oh, no. insane. It's mad. It's, it's absolutely insane. And I don't think that happens by coincidence. I think you definitely have to mastermind the success mm -hmm. that they've achieved, the Kardashians and the Jenners. So yeah, uh, she, she's great. And she actually said something that I live by. And I, I kind of claimed it as my, my phrase. Mm -hmm. She said, if someone says no, you're talking to the wrong person. Yeah. And I live by that every <laughs> single day. I never accept no, because I think there's always one way yeah. you can get what you're We've looking to go after. You've got an example of when you've not accepted no as an answer. Just in job opportunities and things that I'm pursuing, mm. I might go to one particular person. I can't think of a specific example now, but I just remember like when I'm seeking something and I have managed to get it in the end, mm. I go to one particular person and they, they're not necessarily helpful. So I then, I kind of, I kind mm. of circumvent them and I go, I, I go on LinkedIn and I find out who's their <laughs> boss. Uh, or I go to a competitor, like yeah. another company that's similar to what I'm actually trying to get. And then I, I go to them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if you try hard enough and you speak to the right people, because you might find out that someone someone loves your experience, or someone loves your personality, but you don't necessarily click with the first person you go to. Yeah. So never stop if you get a no. Mm -hmm. I see no. I see no as an incentive to keep to keep going. Mm -hmm. It actually, yeah, it, it motivates me more than the yes. I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you've got a manager and you've got teams like working around you and stuff like that. But how much of what you've done is because of the actions that you've taken, like? Because I think a lot of people who are in the social media space or have management and stuff like that, you know, who might tune in and listen to this. Mm. How much is, is, are you behind this driving force of wanting to grow the Ryan Mark brand? A lot of it, a lot of it. I mean, full credit to David, Jason, mm -hmm. Sophie, Joanna, and the people that I work with day to day. They have a job and they're great. I mean, they've got so much experience. David especially has been doing yeah. showbiz for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He looks after the likes of Vanessa Feltz and those of other big names. So he knows what he's talking about. And I always go to him for advice and he's well connected and he puts me forward for the best opportunities. But I think anyone in this industry, anyone that's looking to get into TV, journalism, commentary, you need to you need to really push yourself. There's mm -hmm. no one else who's going to push you more than yourself. And I've realized this kind of, not from other people telling me, just through my own lived experiences, because if I want something, I have to go after it. Because as much as David is going to push me for different opportunities, there's only so much he can do. And he's great at connecting, but I need to be the one who's creating the attraction. I need to make myself hot. I need to make myself interesting for celebrity bookers or for sh uh, producers to get me on their shows or for job opportunities or brands to be interested in me. And that's through driving social media. That's through expanding my knowledge. That's through doing things like this. And if I, if I don't have that internal drive, then 
no one else is going to push you. Mm-hmm. You can't just rely on someone else to co- to dictate your fate. Mm-hmm. Like no one, this is my life. And if I just put it in the hands of someone else, like a commissioner, the head of a, a channel, my manager or whoever it is, that's they've had their life. They've made their own money. They're doing their own thing. Whatever they're doing in their life, that's their success. If I if I just hand over responsibility to them, I think that would be really negligent and I think I would disappoint myself. Mm. A lot of people don't think like that, like that, like that, you know. You don't think so? No. I think a lot of people feel like a reassurance, like, oh, I've got a manager now, they'll do the they'll do the hard work for me. You're one of the very few, like I know we obviously spoke with management management and stuff like that, but we know that like the the want to come on the show, to come on Talk 20s came from you originally. It wasn't yeah. your, a suggestion from your manager. It was kind of something you'd seen someone else on the show and you were like, I think I'd really like to to go on that podcast. And so I know from speaking to you that that, that we see obviously so many different guests that will come on the podcast mm. and often it's either us reaching out to them or their management suggesting to us, just suggesting to them like this should be a show that you should go on. Yeah. So I think you're unique in that. No, I appreciate that and recognising that. I think I watched the podcast and I loved it. Mm-hmm. So in my head, how I rationalise it is I want to do the podcast. I want to talk about my experiences. I want a bit of therapy for free. (laughs) (laughs) And I also want to maybe inspire people tuning in. So my thinking is, I'm going to reach out. What's the worst that can happen? I think my best advice for anyone, and again, this is like my guiding mantra every single day, is the worst someone can say to you is no. Mm. Why am I scared of a rejection? Is it embarrassing? Maybe. Are they going to judge me for being desperate or would they enjoy rejecting me? Are they going to get some kind of gratification out of saying no? Maybe they will. Maybe there's some sadistic people out there that would enjoy mm-hmm. saying no. Maybe they don't like me. I accept that I'm contentious. Mm-hmm. So maybe people will actually take pleasure out of saying no to me. But if they say no, that's fine. I move mm-hmm. on. And it goes back to what Chris Jenner says. If someone says no, you're talking to the wrong person. Mm-hmm. So if you said no, I'll go to another podcast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'd find the opportunity to talk about what I'm talking about now. But this is the be- I, the reason I reached out because I think this is the best platform mm-hmm. to reach the audience that I want to reach. And I think you do an amazing job at presenting. You've had amazing you. guests. So that's why I went after this opportunity. But I mm-hmm. think what I would say to everyone is never be scared of a rejection and just go for it. Mm-hmm. And just no is not the worst thing in the world. And I, I mainly, you know, I get, I get yeses a lot. Yeah. But then I, I think you those. must do because of like, you know, I think also the involvement that you have in kind of pursuing your dreams, like you can tell that like, this is the goal that I want to do. And I go out, go out and do it. Like, yeah. 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 And sometimes I'm surprised, like I, I'm not pessimistic, but sometimes I, I go after something, think it might be a no, but then, they, you know, mm-hmm. they surprise me with a yes. And yeah. it's even more yeah. fulfilling <laughs> because you're surprised yourself. So yeah, that's what I would say. Let's talk about some of those no's then mm. because a lot of people will consider like getting a no as a failure, right? But we know from talking to so many people on the podcast that failure failure can actually be a good thing. It can probably send you off in another direction, find your other person who's going to say yes when the other people say no. For you, is there some an example that you've got where you felt like something was a quote unquote failure, but actually it was something that you learned something from it, you found a new opportunity through it. Have you got an example you can share with our audience? I'd say the biggest and maybe most known example of me failing well, in front of millions of people was on The Apprentice mm-hmm. because I got fired. I didn't win the show. So I guess categorically that is a failure. I failed The Apprentice. I didn't become, I didn't get the investment. I didn't become a partner with Lord Sugar. So I failed mm-hmm. and it was very public. I think 7 million people tuned into that episode. It was week eight and I was I avoided being project manager for so many weeks. And then Lord Sugar, <laughs> he said, you and this other person have to be project manager. And it was the worst kind of task. I thought, gosh, of all tasks, and I have to do this one. And it was me looking after a team of, I'd say the average age was about 35. And I was 19. Yeah. So I was like, gosh, this is, you know, this is a, this is a challenge. And it was on a train and it was a corporate away day and I had to deliver this experience on a, on the, an Orient, like it was like the Orient Express. Yeah. And I had to provide food and experiences and entertainment. It was so, there were so many moving parts. It was incredibly difficult and I lost 
by the smallest of margins, but I still lost. It was mm-hmm. like five pounds difference between winning and losing. At this point, you'd want to yeah, just get like, what you want be like, I'll give <laughs> exactly. you the five pounds. I bribed Lord Drew. I mean, yeah. you just need the money. But I mean, <laughs> I, I was just like, oh, for crying out loud. Yeah. But that was... I, I, and I recognize now, and I recognized at the time, I messed up. I didn't ask for the allergies. I didn't ask for the food intolerances. Yeah. And then I got re, I, and people were requesting refunds because they couldn't eat the food. So, yeah, when I look back on that, that was a massive failure. Mm. But also, I didn't get the money. I didn't, I, I didn't start the business that I went on the show with. And, but what, what that failure allowed me to do was to realize that I was able to pivot my career into something else in the media Mm -hmm. because of The Apprentice. And although I didn't win and I didn't start that business 50-50 with Lord Sugar, I was able to then create my own kind of success off the back of the show. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that failure doesn't always mean that you can't get to where you want to go. No, absolutely. I think that's probably the best example of failure we've ever had. You know, you know a lot of people go, oh, I crashed my car, I, I lost my passport and couldn't get on a flight. And you're like, I failed The Apprentice. <laughs> it's quite a good one. It's yeah, a it's good kind example. Of, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's not <laughs> something I base about, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good one. Uh, the other thing we like to talk on the podcast is that no matter, you know, and you've been very candid with us on the sofa, but like no matter the person that sat on the sofa, whatever they're an expert in, whether they're a TV personality, whether they're an expert in all different kinds of areas, that everyone in their 20s, no one is the finished product. We are all working on being our, like the best person we can be and improving ourselves. For you, mm-hmm. what's one area of your life that you're like, that is so bad, I've got to improve it? One area of my life. I feel like I'm very independent mm-hmm. and I feel like I don't need anyone to kind of, not to help me, but I feel like I don't need anyone to support me emotionally maybe a bit of a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. And I think that doesn't always help. Maybe I come across a bit frosty initially, but I'm actually... Very nice, guys. I'm very lovely. I mean, I didn't pay to say that. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think maybe that's something I should work on because I kind of, maybe a bit tunnel vision. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can do this myself. I don't need anyone to help. I don't need any collaboration. I maybe don't need a partner. Yeah, I was going to say, are you talking about romantically or are you talking about like family or platonic friends? Like what are you, what are you talking about in this context? Probably professionally, platonically with friends, also Mm -hmm. romantically as well. I'm kind of like in all of those facets. I feel like I have this lone, like lonely mentality. Not Mm -hmm. that I'm lonely, that I feel like I can do things alone. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing I'd like to work on Mm -hmm. and maybe bring that barrier down maybe sooner. Mm -hmm. I went to a dinner party over the weekend and I don't know I was like when I'm kind of like it takes a bit to warm me up okay I don't know how I could compare it to I was going to think of like a food example <laughs> I don't know if you know that, that, it takes a bit to I don't know I don't like, like a jacket egg, potato maybe like an, a board egg or something okay yeah, would, that, would that work a board egg yeah well, kind of no but like the reverse like instead of soft initially like runny yeah your hard initially, like a jacket potato. Well, okay, yeah. Because jacket potatoes are hard, and yeah. then they they put them in the oven. Have you ever had a jacket potato? I think I have. Okay, I think I have. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> They're hard when you begin with and they get squishy at the end. I don't eat a lot of jacket potatoes myself, but I just, I looked at you going, what the heck is a jacket potato? <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, maybe a potato. Yeah, potato. Yeah, so a potato. Uh, hard and then becomes soft. Yeah. I mean, that sounds maybe slightly sexualized, but n- <laughs> nothing, not, uh, just, just, yeah, it takes a bit to, to break me down. Yeah. So okay. that's what I would work on. Let's take a quick pause for a second. If you're an OG listener of the podcast, you'll know I haven't always had the easiest ride with my mental health in my 20s. Our newest paid partner, BetterHelp, which gives you access to online therapists, is something that's helped me immensely. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. Whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. To get started, you fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you'll get matched with a therapist, in most cases within 48 hours or less. You'll then be able to schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash talk twenties. And that link will also get you 10% off your first month too. Yeah. Opening up more. I, yeah. think, I think you've kind of done that with this podcast. And this is obviously, you know, you must know that that's an area that you want to work on because obviously that's why you came onto the podcast because mm. this isn't anything like you've done before. You're usually doing comedy or, or, you know, reality TV and stuff like that or debates and stuff. So yeah. 
I think you're yeah. well on your way to doing that. We always end this podcast by asking the same question to every single one of our guests. And it's if you could look back at 20 year old Ryan Mark and give him just one piece of advice that would see you through your twenties, mm. what would you want to say? I would say to a 20 year old version of me to just enjoy the moments more, live mm. in the moments. I, that sounds really... It's kind of going back to what we're talking about. It's cringe. Uh, cringe. Cringe all you like. It's yeah. good to be cringy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not really... So, I don't know. Does it sound so weird? I would just say, yeah, just embrace all of the opportunities, but just kind of feel like you... like Feel, feel in the moment. Yeah, be sometimes. present. Yeah, be present because yeah. I don't think I, I was all the time... And that isn't good. Mm. I think it, it can be to my detriment. So I think to just live for the moment, mm -hmm. that's what I would say. I love that. I often look back on times and I'm like, that was such a happy time. But then I was like, did I at the time think it was a happy time? Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, you know, I just compare all the time. So I think you're right. Being in the moment, being present, loving the life that you are living right now instead of focusing too much on well, what's ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, just to breathe, relax, laugh, have fun. Mm -hmm. Cela mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you this question now. What's next for you? <laughs> <laughs> Even though you said be present. Have you got uh, anything exciting things coming up that we should be aware of? Th yeah, there's always there's always things I'm working on yeah. in the in the pipeline. I've just launched a podcast that's very much in production. Mm -hmm. So I'm just getting all of my guests lined up and it's it's difficult because my focus is going to be on reality stars. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are divas, a lot of them want <laughs> XYZ. So it's and they're very busy as well, yeah. doing all kinds of things. So yeah, I'm working on that. And I'm working on a documentary as well about coming out. So mm -hmm. I'm going to see where that takes me into the new year. And yeah, there's lots of exciting shows have been commissioned. So I'm hoping Amazing. you might see me on one of those. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just striving for the next thing. I know where I want to end up. So it's all about all of these little baby steps towards mm -hmm. that. And each little thing helps, I think. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. I absolutely love chatting to you. And that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Talk 20s podcast this year. We have absolutely loved chatting to so many different guests. We're going to be back in the new year with a brand new season of Talk 20s. Stay tuned. Make sure you're following. Leave us a five-star review and we'll see you in the new year.